Okay, uh, hopefully you had a good uh, conference weekend and maybe enjoyed the good weather as well. Uh, we have a temple in Singapore, our two students from uh, Singapore, I'm sure are excited about that. But, uh, so uh, a couple announcements before we start. Uh, there's a new bacon quiz that uh, is very carbohydrate related. So that's one that uh, you can uh, work on between now and uh, our next exam or, or now in the final exam. Uh, the take-home quiz, we talked about that on Friday, uh, so you should have downloaded that by now. If you haven't, you should download it today and get started on it. Uh, it's not the sort of thing you want to wait until Thursday evening to start on uh, because uh, you might run out of time if you do that. So we're going to uh, learn about lipids uh, today in, in Chapter 28, uh, and we're going to classify our lipids into two categories, hydrolyzable and non-hydrolyzable. We'll cover all the hydrolyzable lipids and we'll start uh, with the non-hydrolyzable as well, which we'll then finish off on Wednesday. So lipids are unique in, in biomolecules. They are not classified according to their functional groups or their specific structures, the way that carbohydrates and proteins are. They're classified according to a physical property. Now, of course, their functional groups do determine their physical properties, so there is a relationship there. But lipids are simply biomolecules that are soluble in organic solvents. So that tells us that they're going to be significantly less polar than our other types of biomolecules that are soluble in water. Uh, but it also indicates that there's going to be a much wider range of structures in the lipid category than what we see in the uh, protein and carbohydrate category. And that's certainly the case. Uh, we have three types of lipids shown here on the screen, a prostaglandin, a triacylglycerol, and a steroid. While they do indeed have some polar functional groups present, uh, we see that they are primarily hydrocarbon in nature. Uh, and these long hydrocarbon chains uh, are what render them insoluble in water and uh, soluble in organic solvents. So uh, the important things to note about lipids uh, are that, uh, the important things to know for tests and things like that is to be able to classify them. So by the end of the chapter, you should be able to look at a lipid uh, and tell not only if it is a hydrolyzable or a non-hydrolyzable lipid, but which of the subcategories it fits into. So a hydrolyzable lipid is one that can be cleaved in water and usually the presence of acid or base to generate two or more smaller molecules. Uh, hydrolyzable lipids tend to contain esters or ester relatives such as phosphoesters. Uh, ester hydrolysis, esters can be hydrolyzed to give carboxylic acids and alcohols. Uh, and so on the screen here, the triacylglycerol is a hydrolyzable uh, uh, lipid. So triacylglycerols, phospholipids, and waxes are our three categories of hydrolyzable lipids. Uh, and then the non-hydrolyzable lipids, these ones are not cleaved in the presence of water, uh, acids, or bases. Uh, and those are fat-soluble vitamins, acosinoids, terpenes, and steroids. Okay. Uh, and so by the end of class on Wednesday, you should be able to look at a lipid structure and put it in one of those seven categories. Uh, here we have a steroid, a prostaglandin. Those are both non-hydrolyzable lipids. You see there's no ester present in the molecule. And um, uh, in contrast to the triacylglycerol that is hydrolyzable. So recognizing which category a given structure will fit in. And then there are some cases where we have discussed or will discuss the biological functions of lipids in terms of their structural features. And so you should be able to explain uh, those types of examples. Uh, we have studied lipid chemistry, discussed lipid chemistry prior to this chapter, uh, quite a bit in fact. This says chapter 29, that's uh, the table from the old book. Uh, they, they changed the position of our current chapter 29. It used to be chapter 26. Uh, and so what was chapter 29 in, in older editions of the book is now chapter 28 in your edition. So if you just change 
these 29s to 28, everything is accurate. Uh, but all of these sections are still the same because the order of these chapters did not change. But you see, we've studied a lot of lipid chemistry uh, earlier in the class. And some of that involved explaining the functions of these molecules in terms of their structures. Back in chapter three, we discussed soap. We discussed how soap can, can clean grease uh, and, and other nonpolar deposits off of uh, uh, surfaces. Um, we discussed how uh, uh, vitamin A, we discussed that a little bit in chapter three. Uh, we also discussed vitamin A in chapter 16 in the context of vision. Uh, and we explained how the structure of vitamin A or retinol uh, allows us to see. Uh, and so those are some things that we'll review in the course of this chapter, and you should review additionally uh, to be able to explain uh, how the structures of these molecules enable their functions in nature. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the first category of hydrolyzable lipids that we will discuss, which are the waxes. So uh, a wax is a ester, uh, an ester that is comprised of a long chain fatty acid uh, and a long chain alcohol. So you link these two long chain species together and you get a really, really long chain uh, with an ester in the middle that is a wax. So that right here we have spermaceti wax, uh, which comes from sperm whales. And you see that that comes from a 16 carbon carboxylic acid linked to a 16 carbon alcohol. So we have 32 carbons uh, and two oxygens present. Uh, so if you do the math, you'll see that there's going to be no water solubility here. Uh, this is a very, very nonpolar molecule. So what is wax used for? What, what would you use wax for? If you were trying to take care of your car and put wax on your car, why would you do that? Does anybody put wax on your car? If not, you probably should. It's maybe not as necessary in Utah, but uh, yes, go ahead. Rick. Yeah, it uh, provides a water resistant coating. Okay, so if you waxed your car nicely, it rains, the water just beads up uh, on the surface of your car. Uh, so it just provides a protective water resistant coating. That's precisely what wax is used for in nature as well. Now, you might say sperm whales. Why do sperm whales need a wax coating? That's actually not why sperm whales use. I'm not sure why sperm whales use spermaceti wax, to be honest. So it's kind of a curious example to choose. But uh, wax is found in nature in places other than sperm whales. Two of the most common places waxes are found uh, is on the feathers of birds, particularly waterfowl, birds that spend some time in the water, uh, will have a waxy coating on their feathers. And that is simply to protect them from water, okay, to, to provide a nice uh, water repellent, water resistant coating. So the water beads up on their feathers instead of just soaking them. Uh, and then leaves will also, many, many leaves will also have a waxy coating. If you've collected leaves before, you may have noticed uh, that, that many leaves will have a waxy coating. The purpose of the wax on the leaves is actually to keep water inside so that the plant is not losing water due to evaporation. Okay, plants take water in through the roots. So they don't need to take water in through the leaves so they can have a waxy coating on the leaves, but they don't wanna lose water, particularly plants that grow in arid environments where there's uh, little precipitation. Uh, once the plant has absorbed the moisture in through the roots, it wants to keep that uh, moisture inside and so it has a waxy coating on the leaves to prevent loss of water due to evaporation. So the function of a wax is exactly what you would expect based on using waxes to, to wax your car. Provides a water resistant, water repellent coat uh, because you don't have a compatibility of intermolecular forces. Uh, you, you cannot form, water cannot hydrogen bond to wax. Um, with the exception of this ester, but that's such a tiny portion of the wax molecule, it's negligible, uh, and water cannot form van der Waals uh, attractive forces with the wax. So what happens when water gets on a coating of wax is it just beads up, the water is uh, forming hydrogen bonds to each other uh, because there's no way for it to interact with the wax. Any questions about wax? 
Okay, so that's our simplest, simplest class of hydro, hydrolyzable lipids. The next one we'll talk about are the triacylglycerols. Okay, and we've seen these before in class. Glycerol is a triol molecule. It has three carbons and three oxygens. Glycerol would have three OH groups. A triacylglycerol has three esters, where we have attached long chain fatty acids to these OH groups. Okay. And I've used R, R prime, and R double prime here to indicate that those fatty acids can be identical with each other or they can be different. So, uh, and these triacylglycerols, by the way, are the most abundant lipids. These are the most abundant lipids in nature. Okay. Uh, we can have simple triacylglycerols where all three of those fatty acids are the same, or we can have mixed triacylglycerols, as the name implies, we're mixing and matching uh, the fatty acid components uh, of those triacylglycerols. So here we have a table uh, showing us the most common fatty acids. We talked about fatty acids earlier in the class, and we divide them into saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. The unsaturated fatty acids have double bonds. What do we know about the double bonds in naturally occurring unsaturated fatty acids? What is their stereochemistry? It is cis or Z, okay? So they're always going to occur as the cis or the Z alkene in nature. Uh, a couple other things we notice about them from this table is that they come in even numbers. There's a reason for that. We'll explain that in a few minutes, why they always have even numbered uh, numbers of carbons uh, in their chains. Uh, and then, of course, we also see that the unsaturated fatty acids have significantly lower melting points than the saturated fatty acids, meaning that the unsaturated fatty acids are liquids at room temperature whereas the saturated fatty acids are solids at room temperature. Why is this? Why do the saturated fatty acids have higher melting points than the unsaturated fatty acids? This was something we covered. Okay, greater van der Waals forces, why? Okay, the cis double bond puts a kink in the chain that you cannot unravel because you can't rotate about the cis double bond. This is shown very nicely in this molecular model here, which shows a triacylglycerol with saturated fatty acids as opposed to one that has a single unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, and we see that that kink in the chain prevents you from packing those chains close together, reducing the van der Waals forces. If you have less van der Waals forces holding chain, and notice this is with triacylglycerols, but it works for the free fatty acids as well. Uh, you're, you're going to have, uh, if you have a sample of a saturated fatty acid, those chains will be packed together more tightly than if you have a sample of an unsaturated fatty acid. So that means that unsaturated fatty acids are referred to as oils because they are liquids at room temperature, uh, whereas saturated fatty acids are referred to as fats uh, because they are solids at room temperature. So here we have a table showing you the composition of various fats and oils. Uh, and we see there is some mixing uh, of saturated and unsaturated, but we see that uh, beef, so fat from uh, cattle, is predominantly saturated fatty acids with some unsaturated material. We see that uh, milk, I'm not sure, uh, this doesn't add up to 100%, uh, but we do see that milk has more saturated than unsaturated, if we look at it that way. Uh, and then we see all, most of these uh, vegetable uh, products uh, have predominantly unsaturated fats, uh, with the exception of coconut oil. Coconut oil actually has more saturated fat 
than, uh, than beef or milk. Uh, and then palm oil is also relatively high uh, in saturated uh, fatty acids. So what uh, health problem are saturated fatty acids associated with? Heart disease it leads to elevated cholesterol. Uh, it causes, uh, can contribute to the formation of plaques uh, in your arteries. Okay. So uh, you want more unsaturated fatty acids and less saturated fatty acids in your diet. So let's look at some reactions we've learned of uh, triacylglycerols. So here is the uh, hydrolysis of triacylglycerols. Um, ester hydrolysis, we learned in chapter 22, can be accomplished in the presence of water with either acid or base present. If uh, we use acid, then it is simply the reverse of the Fischer esterification reaction. Uh, and if we use base, uh, it is the saponification reaction. Uh, saponification coming from uh, the, the term soap, uh, uh, being related to soap making, uh, because the carboxylates, the long chain carboxylates you get from those fatty acids are very good soap molecules, as we learned in chapter three. Uh, and enzymes can do this in our bodies as well. Okay, so this is how we can hydrolyze these hydrolyzable lipids into glycerol and long chain fatty acids. So uh, two other reactions we learned of uh, triacylglycerols uh, or their fatty acids, uh, hydrogenation. So we can use hydrogen and palladium carbon to convert unsaturated fatty acids into saturated fatty acids. Why would we want to do that? The saturated ones we just said are associated with heart disease. Why are we trying to do this? Are we trying to make more money for cardiologists uh, or is there another purpose? There is another purpose. We discussed it. It's tied to this other reaction we see here on the screen. Okay, Minnie? Yes, so uh, one, the third reaction we learned of uh, uh, fatty acids and triacylglycerols is the oxidation of the unsaturated fatty acids. When they're exposed to oxygen, an oxygen molecule being a diuretical can abstract a hydrogen atom from the backbone at the allylic carbon, generating an allylic radical, which will then react with another molecule of oxygen, generating this uh, hydroperoxide species, uh, which can then be uh, converted into further oxidation products, okay? Uh, so this is how oils go rancid. Anybody who's stored olive oil or other oils for long periods of time knows that they go rancid. They give, they, they, the smell goes bad, the taste also goes bad, and that's due to this air oxidation. So if you remove some, usually not all, but if you, if you perform a hydrogenation long enough, to remove some but not all of the double bonds in your unsaturated uh, fats, your oils, uh, then you will increase the shelf life of that material. So that's one reason. There was a second reason we mentioned as well. How many of you have ever poured oil on your pancakes or your toast? I don't see a lot of hands being raised. How many people have spread margarine on your toast or your pancakes? A few people nodding their heads and raising their hand. Yes, so margarine is a butter substitute. Margarine is made from vegetable oils and you partially hydrogenate your vegetable oils so that you increase the melting point enough so that it has this semi-solid sort of consistency that you have that allows you to spread it. So consumer preference for the physical properties of the material uh, give you a vegetable oil substance that you can spread. However, there is a problem with this hydrogenation, which we mentioned a little bit uh, back when we covered this in chapter 12. And that is that there's a byproduct that is formed uh, whenever you hydrogenate a cis alkene, you get a small amount of the trans alkene that forms. Uh, and what's the problem with trans fatty acids? You've probably heard of trans fats before. Yes. 
Yes, a similar uh, but actually a bit worse of an effect, according to many research studies, uh, even worse than the saturated fats uh, for the health of your heart. The mechanism by which the uh, alkene isomerizes from cis to trans, uh, we don't have time to go through it in detail, but it is related to some of the steps that we learned in the Heck reaction. We learned in a Heck reaction that you can, when you have an alkyl group attached to a palladium, you can form a transalkene via a beta hydride elimination. And that's exactly what happens because you get an alkyl group attached to palladium when you hydrogenate double bonds. And so a small amount of that will go down the heck type pathway and generate a transalkene. So you can't prevent it when you do this hydrogenation. You can only minimize it. And so once the negative health effects of the trans fats became known, then the uh, companies, the food companies, uh, adjusted by modifying the reaction conditions, limiting the reaction time, uh, modifying the catalyst to be able to minimize the production of those trans fats. Uh, and then they presumably also uh, tweak their separation and purification process to try to remove as much of that trans fat byproduct as possible. But if you see a food label that says it is free of trans fats, that's usually not completely accurate. That just means that the trans fats are present below a certain threshold. So the FDA uh, has defined a certain threshold below which the food companies can claim that the foods are free of trans fats. So there's usually going to be still trace amounts of them, uh, but usually not uh, an amount to be too worried about uh, unless your diet is exclusively from margarine or something like that, uh, which I, I certainly would not recommend. Yes. That's a good question. Uh, I do, I'm not familiar enough with those specific reactions to know the answer. So it would probably depend on the catalyst though. There are some catalysts that might coordinate to the esters and might be directed to the alkenes closer to the esters. Whereas there might be other catalysts that would go to the alkenes further down the chain that might be less hindered. So there, there, there may be a way to do it either way, but, but I don't know for sure. That's a very good question. Any other questions? So what is the function of triacylglycerols in nature? Energy storage, yes. Triacylglycerols are our most uh, effective sources of energy. We can, for, for every gram of triacylglycerol, we can get nine kilocalories of energy. Nine kilocalories of energy per one gram of triacylglycerol. By comparison, for proteins and carbohydrates, our other two types of molecules we can get energy from, we get four kilocalories per mole of energy, four kilocalories of energy per gram. Okay? So per gram, we're getting more than twice as much energy from triacylglycerols than we are from carbohydrates and proteins. Although the advantage of the carbohydrates and proteins is that they are water soluble, as we mentioned uh, last week. So how do we get energy from triacylglycerols? Well, this pathway here called the beta oxidation pathway, this is a figure from that same tech, that same book I mentioned to you on Friday that the glycolysis figures came from. Now this shows you a little bit of how that process occurs. So the first thing that happens is we hydrolyze our triacylglycerols and we get our fatty acids. And then the second thing that happens is those fatty acids react with coenzyme A to generate thioesters. Remember, coenzyme A has a sulfur, uh, and that sulfur uh, is generating a thioester. So a fatty acyl coenzyme A is simply a thioester of a fatty acid. So once we've done that, the first thing that happens is a reaction we can't do in the lab, and that is just remove two hydrogen atoms to make an alkene. We don't know how to do that in the lab, uh, but enzymes can do it. Uh, and so an enzyme with FAD in the active site, which accepts the two hydrogens, uh, generates an alkene. So we're not going to talk about the mechanism of that reaction since it's complicated. 
But once we get to this alpha beta unsaturated fatty acyl coenzyme A derivative, we can understand the chemistry that's happening in the next three steps. Okay. The first one is addition of water to the beta carbon. We know that alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds are electrophilic at both the carbonyl carbon and the beta carbon. We talked about that in a couple of chapters. So we can perform Michael reactions. We can perform conjugate additions or 1,4 additions of organocuprates. We're used to seeing strong nucleophiles adding to the beta carbon of an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. Well, when you have an enzyme present, you can actually use a weak nucleophile. So that's the thing we haven't seen before is a weak nucleophile such as water performing a conjugate addition or a 1,4 addition. So the water attacks that beta carbon and we end up with an alcohol beta to the carbonyl. Okay, and then the next step is something that uh, we've seen before, a biological oxidation of alcohols to give ketones. Uh, that's performed by enzymes that have the cofactor uh, NAD plus at the active site. And we went over the mechanism of that in chapter 10. Uh, so that's giving us a ketone. That's also allowing us to store energy. Uh, ATP is the most commonly uh, known molecule that, that serves as a, a high energy molecule, uh, a way that we can uh, store energy because then it can react to give lower energy species. Uh, NADH, the product of this oxidation, also does that. If you go back to chapter 10, and we also cover this in chapter 20, and you look at the structures of these species, you see that NAD plus is aromatic and NADH is not. So NADH is higher in energy than NAD plus. And so when NADH is used in subsequent reactions, usually reductions, energy is given off. Okay? So, so this is one way in which we're storing energy in this process. And then the next thing that happens, uh, we've learned about beta ketoesters uh, back in chapter 24, I think it was. Uh, beta ketoesters are formed by Claisen reactions. And they can undergo retro Claisen reactions. You can cleave the carbon carbon bond of a beta ketoester, and that will give you two esters as a result. Okay? A beta ketothioester can also undergo a retro Claisen reaction, and that's going to give you two thioesters. So this is a catabolism process. We learned on Friday that glycolysis is a type of catabolism where we take larger biomolecules, chop them into smaller pieces, uh, and we uh, store energy as a result. So this is also catabolism, this beta oxidation pathway, uh, because the uh, thiol, the coenzyme A thiol, will attack the carbonyl carbon of the, of the ketone, form a tetrahedral intermediate. That tetrahedral intermediate breaks down releasing an enolate that gets protonated in the active site. And what we end up with is two different thioesters. One of those thioesters is acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A is going to get metabolized in what is known as the uh, citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. Uh, that produces a bunch of ATP molecules. Uh, it, it, it ultimately turns the uh, two carbons here into carbon dioxide and water is produced, and as part of that process, ATP is generated, okay? So this shows you how we get energy from fats, from fatty acids. We produce uh, NADH, that's one part of it, and we produce acetyl coenzyme A, uh, which then is used in the citric acid cycle to produce more ATP. You can also see why our fatty acids have even numbers of carbons in them, so that we can chop them up into these two carbon fragments, these acetyl coenzyme A molecules. Okay? So any questions about how we get energy from our triacylglycerols? So we could actually view triacylglycerols as the biological equivalent of fossil fuels. They're similar, they have similar structures. Uh, they're essentially hydrocarbons. Um, uh, and so that also gives us the idea that perhaps we could use triacylglycerols in internal combustion engines. And in fact, that is done. Most of you have probably heard of biodiesel. Biodiesel is a mixture of vegetable oils with diesel fuel that can be burned in combustion engines. Okay. 
Uh, and actually, the biofuels predate uh, the, the current uh, time period. Uh, they were actually used in World War II. Uh, in World War II, there was a shortage of fossil fuels to power all of the airplanes, the tanks, the jeeps, all of these vehicles that were used in the war. And so in some areas, they were powering their vehicles with coconut oil. Okay. In areas where they had coconuts, of course, so the, 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 the war that was fought in the Pacific, uh, specifically the South Pacific, uh, they would power their Jeeps and other vehicles with coconut oil. Now this uh, has a significant limitation uh, because I showed you on the slide that coconut oil is primarily made from saturated fats. It has a significantly higher melting point than other oils. In fact, the melting point of coconut oil is 24 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so below that temperature, it's going to be a solid. It's, I've never seen anybody use a solid fuel in an internal combustion engine before. So this, you couldn't use this in the war that was fought in Europe, for example, but when they were fighting in the South Pacific, uh, when the temperatures are almost always above 24 degrees Celsius, they were able to use coconut oil uh, to fuel their vehicles. Okay, any questions about triacylglycerols. So a related type of hydrolyzable lipid uh, to a triacylglycerol is the phospholipid. Phospholipids uh, have at least two categories. There's the phosphoacylglycerol, which we'll show you in a minute. But first, we'll just refresh your memory of the structure of phosphoric acid, H3PO4. This is phosphoric acid here on the board. And if we replace two of the OHs with ethers, with alkoxy type groups, we generate something that's referred to as a phosphodiester. Okay, these groups are usually different. This oxygen is typically written with a negative charge because at physiological pHs, because that OH is acidic, that oxygen is deprotonated uh, at physiological pHs. So this is what is known as a phosphodiester. Uh, and we learned that phosphodiesters make up the backbone of DNA and RNA, uh, but they are also present in lipids. So, uh, one type of lipid where we will see phosphodiesters is the phosphoacylglycerol. So a phosphoacylglycerol is similar in structure to a triacylglycerol, but we replace one of the esters with a phosphodiester. Okay, so we'll draw what that would look like. Here's our ester. Here's our glycerol backbone. I'll just put an extra carbon there. So we have two esters, and then we have one phosphodiester. And typically, the phosphodiester has an ammonium group. The alkyl group has this ammonium group in it. Okay. Now, because we have different groups along the glycerol backbone, this central carbon becomes a stereocenter. And I'll draw it with a wedge because it's usually in the R configuration that we see here. This particular phosphodiester is called phosphatidylethanolamine. also known as cephalin. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in food products, uh, and it's referred to as uh, cephalin. It's not one compound because it can have different uh, 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 fatty acids here attached. So this is a class uh, of compounds, a group of compounds. Uh, and then another common one, another common phosphoacylglycerol that you'll see is one where instead of having this ammonium group in your 
chain here, you have a trimethyl ammonium group where you have three methyl groups instead of three hydrogens attached. And this is known as phosphatidylcholine, probably a molecule you've heard of before. Uh, this is also known as lecithin. When you see it on food labels, it's usually referred to as lecithin. So what are phosphoacylglycerols used for in nature? Okay, if you don't remember, uh, we have a figure here that will hopefully jog your memory. So here's a molecular model. This is a lecithin molecule uh, with that ammonium ion there. So we have these two nonpolar tails that associate with each other. Uh, we have this charged polar head group that's got the negatively charged phosphodiester, the positively charged ammonium ion, uh, often drawn like this. I kind of cringe when I see that because organic chemists, we usually don't like these cartoon structures. We usually prefer the molecular model structures that actually show the molecular structure. Uh, but seeing this will probably give you an idea of what the function of these molecules are in nature. What are they used for? Yes, Grace. Yeah, they make lipid, they assemble into lipid bilayers, uh, which are the main components of cell membranes. So you'll have these molecules stacking next to each other. So those nonpolar tails can associate with each other via van der Waals forces. Those polar head groups can engage with each other via salt bridges electrostatic attractions. Uh, and then uh, water can associate with those polar head groups. You can have ion dipole interactions or hydrogen bonds with water. Uh, and then if they stack in a bilayer fashion, you'll have the tails of another molecule and you'll have a second uh, 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 surface with those polar head groups. So you end up with a lipid bilayer looking like this and you have the water molecules associating with hydrogen bonding or ion dipole interactions. Of course, a cell membrane is not simply a lipid bilayer. There's more to it. Cell membranes have cholesterol in there, providing rigidity. These lipids are generally fairly fluid. Those tails are flopping around. And so to have the right amount of rigidity, we have steroids such as cholesterol inserted in there. We also have these ion channels, these proteins that regulate the flow of ions uh, and other small molecules across the cell membrane. We learned on Friday that we have glycoproteins in our cell membrane uh, and the carbohydrate portions poke out of the cell membrane. Uh, we learned about the blood antigen determinants, the different carbohydrates that come off of uh, the cell membranes of our red blood cells. Okay, so there's a lot uh, of components in a cell membrane, uh, but the major component is the uh, phospholipids, the lipid bilayer. Now those phospholipids are shown here with unsaturated fatty acid chains, but they're not all that way. They can have, with saturated, I'm sorry, they can also have unsaturated chains in them. As you might imagine, the saturated fatty acids will pack more tightly, whereas the unsaturated ones will pack less tightly and introduce more fluidity. So you want the right ratio of saturated to unsaturated fatty acids in your phosphoacylglycerols in your cell membranes. But of course, if you have too many unsaturated ones, now your cell membranes are more susceptible to damage uh, from oxidation, okay? So that's one of the purposes of antioxidants. Nonpolar antioxidants can insert into your cell membranes and protect your unsaturated fats uh, from that air oxidation, okay? Questions about phosphoacylglycerols. Okay, so there's uh, another type of phospholipid known as the sphingomyelins. It's kind of a fun name to say. The sphingomyelins are derivatives of sphingosine, uh, which is similar to glycerol, but not the same. So in sphingosine, you have this long chain uh, alkyl group with a, with a double bond, a, a trans double bond actually. Uh, and then you have a nitrogen here that's used to form an amide with an unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, and then we make a phosphodiester from this uh, alcohol, okay? There's our phosphodiesters. So these are examples of sphingomyelins. 
Uh, and we do find sphingomyelins in our cell membranes. They're mixed in there with the phosphoacylglycerols. They're both types of phospholipids. But there's another place where we find sphingomyelins, and that is they make up something known as the myelin sheath. Okay. Who's heard of the myelin sheath before? Okay. What is it used for? What does it do? It coats, it provides a pro protective coating for neurons or nerve cells, okay? Uh, because these are phospholipids, presumably that protective coating is, is somewhat similar to a cell membrane, okay? It's some sort of a bilayer that coats and protects your neurons. What disease is characterized by degradation of the myelin sheath? Anybody know? Okay, multiple sclerosis, or MS, is characterized by degradation of this myelin sheath, uh, and that allows those nerve cells to get damaged, which manifests itself in the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Okay, so sphingomyelins, uh, just being able to recognize the structure of a sphingomyelin is where we're interested here. Um, all right, any questions on our phospholipids? Okay, uh, that's it for our hydrolyzable lipids. Let's now start talking about our non-hydrolyzable lipids, the ones that do not have esters or phosphodiesters or other groups that can be hydrolyzed with water. Now, in the first category we're going to talk about is the fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamins, the definition has changed over the years, but vitamins are simply small organic molecules, not, not our biopolymers like we've been talking about recently, but our typical small organic molecules that are essential for the function of our bodies. Okay, so the vite part comes from vital. These are vital molecules to our body's functioning. Uh, and so vitamins can be divided into two categories, our water-soluble vitamins and our fat-soluble vitamins. So the fat-soluble vitamins are going to be soluble in organic solvents, insoluble in water. So here's just a summary of some of our hydrolyzable lipids that we looked at. Uh, but let's move over here to our figure showing some fat-soluble vitamins. Now, you don't need to spend any time memorizing these structures, but as you look at these molecules, you should be able to recognize that they will be insoluble in water and therefore would be classified as fat-soluble vitamins. These are interesting molecules. The information we have over here is important, but there's two that are more important than the rest because we have studied their function in nature in terms of their structural features. So let's look at vitamin A. What is vitamin A used for? Vision, yes. So are we eat carrots, our body chops beta carotene in half and generates vitamin A, and then vitamin A is used in the vision process. Who would like to raise their hand and briefly explain how vitamin A helps us see? Okay, Trent. Yes. So we covered this back in chapter 16. So this was what we covered before we started meeting in person. Remember, this was on the videos way back in early January. So um, our body can convert vitamin A into an aldehyde, and it can also hide, or, uh, isomerize. It can use an enzyme to isomerize one of these trans double bonds to a cis double bond. And then it gets conjugated to a protein called opsin to form something that is known as rhodopsin. It forms an imine linkage, an imine linkage with a nitrogen coming from the, uh, the lysine side chain of that protein reacting with the aldehyde we get here. So we have a cis double bond in the middle. We learned in chapter 16 that when you have a highly conjugated system, it can absorb light because the gap in energy between the HOMO and the LUMO, those two frontier molecular orbitals, that gap in energy is equivalent to the energy in the visible light waves. Okay? So when visible light hits our eyes, it hits those uh, rhodopsin proteins uh, in our eyes, the cis double bond gets isomerized to a trans double bond, giving you something that looks more like this. That change in shape gets converted into a nerve impulse that gets turned into vision by our brains. Okay? So that was something we discussed back in chapter 16. 
something you ought to be able to explain. Uh, so uh, if, if it sounds unfamiliar to you, you might want to go back to those chapter 16 videos where we discussed the chemistry of vision. The other one we discussed also in videos that we uh, did when we were not meeting in person uh, was vitamin E. Vitamin E or alpha tocopherol is an antioxidant. We discussed this in chapter 15. It prevents those fatty acids, including the ones in the membranes. You can see how this could insert into a membrane because it has this long chain. It prevents those unsaturated fatty acids from getting damaged. How does it do that? Okay, Trent again. Okay, so what happens is tocopherol will react with radicals to form a stabilized radical. Most radicals are highly reactive intermediates. Uh, and so you get these chain reactions that keep going and going and going and damaging more and more lipids. But your vitamin E, this hydrogen here is going to get abstracted by one of those reactive radicals and generate a highly stabilized radical. If you have a radical on this oxygen, it can be de delocalized onto these fully substituted carbons, giving you tertiary radicals that are also very sterically hindered. So they're resonance stabilized and sterically hindered, so they are less reactive. And we talked about that in chapter 15, so you could go back to the 351M videos uh, and watch the one on antioxidants from chapter 15. So there's a synthetic antioxidant called BHT, uh, also known as butylated hydroxytoluene, uh, that doesn't have this long chain here, but it is a food additive that works on the same principle that protects the unsaturated fatty acids in vegetable oils. Okay? So anytime you see BHT added to preserve freshness uh, listed on a food label, that's a good thing. All right, some people who don't understand organic chemistry will think that's bad. Ooh, we've added this synthetic molecule to our food. It's not organic anymore. Uh, of course, it is an organic substance, uh, and it's a good thing to have in our food products because it preserves the freshness uh, of those products by preventing the air oxidation. All right, any questions on our fat-soluble vitamins? Yes? Yeah, so they can, uh, that, that's a good question. What's the fate of them? And that's a complicated question because there's more than one thing that could happen to them. Uh, so we won't get into that. Uh, the, the, but the main thing to, to re recognize is just that they intercept those rapid radical chain reactions and, 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 and therefore inhibit them from continuing. But, but yeah, their fate is a more complex issue. All right, our next category of hydrolyzable or non-hydrolyzable lipids are the acosinoids. Acosinoid is derived from a Greek word meaning 20. Acosinoids have 20 carbons, and they are derived from a 20 carbon unit, we'll skip over that, known as arachidonic acid. So acosinoids are biosynthesized from arachidonic acid. Shown right here. Uh, enzymes, some enzymes can convert arachidonic acid into leukotrienes, these acyclic acosinoids. So there's four classes of acosinoids, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and prostacyclins. You don't have to memorize those subcategories. Just be able to recognize that all these molecules with 20 carbons are derived from arachidonic acid and are therefore acosinoids. So they play various roles in nature, which we'll show you in a moment one of which is mediating pain and inflammation pathways. That's what the prostaglandins do. Uh, and the cyclooxygenase enzyme is an enzyme that's involved in the early biosynthesis of the cyclic prostaglandins. Cyclooxygenase catalyzes a cycloaddition reaction between this portion of arachidonic acid and a molecule of oxygen. So it turns out that aspirin is an inhibitor of the COX enzymes. Aspirin inhibits the formation of prostaglandins, which cause pain and inflammation. And so that's how you reduce the pain and inflammation, by taking aspirin or other non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories. Okay, So if you've seen the term NA NSAID, that stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And I can't remember what the D stands for. 
Uh, but that would be molecules like ibuprofen, for example. But there's a problem here. The side effect of aspirin is uh, uh, ulcers because there are prostaglandins that protect the lining of your stomach, that, that uh, regulate your gastric secretions. Uh, so Dan Simmons, a BYU faculty member, uh, along with someone at the University of Rochester uh, in the early 90s, independently discovered that there are two forms of the COX enzyme. COX-1, which predominantly uh, produces those uh, prostaglandins that protect your stomach, and COX-2, the one that's involved in the pain and inflammation. So if you could selectively inhibit COX-2, you would have a super painkiller that had less side effects than the... Uh, uh, than aspirin or other NSAIDs. So these molecules came out in the 90s. Uh, Celebrex is the only one still on the market because it was later discovered that prostaglandins produced by COX-2 are also involved in regulating the function of your heart. So there are some undesired heart side effects from these medications. Uh, Celebrex has the least amount of those side effects, so it's still on the market. So here we see some of the biological activity of the acosinoids. Uh, you don't have to memorize these, uh, but a couple things to know about acosinoids is that they are local mediators. Because they are insoluble in water, they are not biosynthesized in a central location and then transported throughout the body. They are biosynthesized at the site they are needed, in the tissues they are needed, and then they do their jobs. Uh, they also have very short half-lives, they're degraded very rapidly. We're not going to go through the pathways by which they're degraded, but they last for a matter of seconds or minutes in the body. So they do their job quickly, and then they get degraded. You can see that prostaglandins are involved in uterine contractions. So women can be given uh, prostaglandins, usually in the form of some sort of a cream, uh, where they can stimulate contractions, uh, uh, inducing labor. They're also involved... Thromboxanes and prostacyclins are involved in regulating blood pressure. Uh, leukotriene dysfunction is involved in asthma because leukotrienes are involved in regulating your smooth muscle contra contractions in your lungs. So lots of different things. The key is just being able to recognize the structure of an acosinoid. Any questions? All right, we'll stop there. We'll talk about terpenes on Wednesday. <laughs>